Well, howdy, everyone. It's been a while. Hi, Skip. Are you ready for me to bring us on home, Skip? Let's do it. Okay, great. I thought so. On home, everybody. I am Jason Evans Growth, digital media librarian at NC State University Libraries. Welcome to AV Geeks at the Hunt Library. Again, not at the Hunt Library. Uh, this is our 14th semester of this series, partnering uh, NC State folks with Raleigh's AV Geeks to discuss vintage educational and classroom films. We're so glad that Skip has decided to join us again and to make this happen. Um, so speaking of Skip, just so you know, if this is your first time with us, or even if it's your 1900th, Skip Alzheimer is the founder of AV Geeks, an NC State alum, and has been for the last several years, maybe a few decades, collecting films made throughout the last century, uh, mostly 16 millimeter educational training and other sorts of how-to movies. Uh, he does an incredible job sharing them with the world and we're so honored that he, he decides to do it with us every semester for the last, I guess, seven years now. That's great. Uh, he currently houses over 36,000 such films at the AV Geeks archive here in Raleigh and uh, shares them as stock footage for films and exhibits as research material and during public events one. Um, so today's theme, our first of the fall 2021 semester is let's look back at labor. And we're very excited to welcome our, our guest, uh, Professor David Zonderman. Dr. Zonderman is professor and department head in history here at NC State, uh, where he teaches uh, American labor history and public history and museums among other things. Dr. Zonderman has written several books about American labor history and has worked with museums across the country, currently working on a book project titled Fighting on the Home Front, Workers in the Civil War. We're so delighted to have Dr. Zonderman with us today. Thank you for joining us again. Um, and a, a brief reminder that over 200 of AV Geeks compilations are available for checkout from the libraries. Uh, and you can also visit avgeeks.com or search AV Geeks in YouTube or at archive.org. And with that, I hand things over to Skip to kick us off. All right. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, and so happy to be back. So 14 seasons, does that mean that this is like our seventh year? It's, yeah. It's, we're in year seven now, yeah. So wow. I don't feel too itchy yet. I feel pretty good about things. No, it's, I, like I, think we're doing we're doing, I think we're doing pretty good. Um, and I keep getting more films, so we can keep doing this forever. We're gonna need a bigger <laughs> internet. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, David, I'm happy to have you back. You were with us, I believe, in the spring. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Thanks for having me again. I'm looking forward to it. Great yeah. way to great way to sort of begin to start celebrating Labor Day coming up in about yeah. two days. Yeah, I think that we figured out, David. You were saying that um, you figured that most people would be leaving on next Friday for Labor a three day weekend. So um, we figured we'd do it now. And then you have something you can think about over Labor Day weekend. Exactly. Um, and so when you were with us last, I'm trying to remember what films we showed. I think we showed films by the AFL-CIO about- No, we did on a couple of like occupations. Like right. Bar including barbers. Job, right, including jobs that don't exist anymore for the most yeah, part. Yeah, like, well, book binding's pretty rare now, so. And, and so I have lots of film of, about working, about labor, about, and, and films made by unions, and actually films made to counter what films were made by unions. Um, because, you know, it was important um, information that was being distributed, and it was being manipulated in some way so that, you know, the different pro-labor and anti-labor people were always kind of at odds trying to, um, you know, get their word out. And um, the two films that I picked, uh, one of them is made by the United Auto Workers uh, Union in uh, 1959. And this is an interesting film. And I think it's interesting because it's going to talk about what's what's happening now. 
like most of my films, they were made 40, 50 years ago, but guess what? They're still important and still talk about what's happening now. And so this film is about automation. And this is when, this is before there were even auto robots. This is when they were coming up with ways and machinery to um, start replacing people, the manual work that people were doing, and the unions were concerned about that. And so uh, this is, I, I, it's, it's like a 30 minute film, but I cut it down to about 16 minutes, but it gets the points across. So we'll watch this and then uh, David, you'll come back and we'll talk about um, what we just saw. Sounds good. Machines without human beings. Machines without human beings? That uncanny spectacle is automation. A foreboding, frightening word. A word to send a shudder through a man or a woman or a child, even in periods of full employment, when wages are decent, jobs are plentiful, and times are good. But during a depression or a recession, when men and women and children seem to be in overproduction, then automation is a word to strike terror in any human heart, especially if that human heart beats in a wage earner's breast. Now people know in a general way what automation means. 150 years ago, the world went through something called the Industrial Revolution. We found out how to build machines that could perform much of the mechanical work men and women used to do. Machines replaced the muscles in our backs and arms and legs, but you still needed human beings to direct the machines, to do the thinking, to do the brain work. But now automation provides machines that do the brain work, that make the decisions men and women used to make in the factories. Electric eyes, limit switches, tapes, punch cards, servo mechanisms. Everybody knows that, but what does this mechanical brain, plus a mechanical muscle, do to people, to jobs, to the way we live? Will whatever happens, happen automatically? Can we do anything? Well, not long ago, UAW President Walter Ruther was in Washington, D.C. There, the members of the Senatorial Commission comes to a plan. Let's let Senator Langer of North Dakota ask the question. Senator Langer? Mr. Ruther, you say that these uh, three big uh, corporations put $7 billion, $200 million into automotive, automotive uh, uh, machinery, whatever it may be. How many men does that put out of work? Well, it's hard to give you an exact figure. These are some of the things we'd like to know more about. We do know, we do know that we have felt the impact of automation. I work first time I went to work in the automotive industry was back in 1927 in February. They were making the last Model T Ford, Senator Langer, and you know all about a Model T because up in your country they were very handy back in the days when the roads weren't very good. Very handy in politics too, driving around. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were. I think, uh, I think Senator Langer still public uh, campaigns of the Model T, I'm not certain. <laughs> anyway, when I went to work at Ford in 1927, this was before we had automation, took thousands and thousands of workers on individual machines to make a Model T engine, which is a relatively simple piece of mechanism. I mean, they bored each cylinder separately and they did all the other things on separate operations. 
1951, the Ford Motor Company opened up a new engine plant in Cleveland, Ohio, adjacent to the, the municipal airport. It was the first fully automated engine plant. They take a rough casting of a V8 engine, which is a very complex piece of mechanism compared to a Model T engine block. They bring it from the foundry and feed it into this automated machining line, completely automatic. And without a worker's hand touching that engine block, 14 and 6 tenths minutes later, it's fully machined. I went through that plant many years back, and the people who were showing me around said to me, I couldn't hardly see the workers because there were just a few here and a few there watching electric panels, red and green lights going on that showed whether the machine was operating to standard. When all the green lights were on, it meant that every tool in a battery of machines was operating to performance, meeting the, the, the precise tolerances of the machining operation. When an amber light came on, the machine was still operating, but this was a signal that the tool in station number 82 was becoming fatigued. The worker got a replacement tool, walked over in front of 82. When the red light went on, the machine stopped. He put the new tool in, the green light came on, she went on. Without a worker's hand touching that, 14 and 6 tenths minutes later, it was fully machined. And so they said to me, aren't you worried about how you're going to collect union dues from all these machines? I said, you know, the thought never occurred to me. What I'm worried about is how you're going to sell Ford cars to all these machines. You know, you can automate the production of automobiles, but consumers are still made, thank God, in the old-fashioned way. This is our trouble. This is our trouble. This is our trouble. Model T to experimental model electronic flash. From muscle and blood to the automated engine line. Mr. Ruther, tell us. What has this meant economically to the automobile industry? If you take some overall figures, which I think indicates what's happening in terms of productivity, in 1947, the industry made 4,798,000 cars and trucks. And we had a workforce in 1947 of 648,800 workers. In 1957, 10 years later, we made 7,220,000 cars and trucks with a workforce of 652,000 workers. In other words, in those 10 years, we had an increase in the total production of cars of 50.5%, with only an increase of one half of 1% in the labor force. So that if you take the level of production in 47, and the level of production in 57, and the level of employment in 47, and the level of employment in 57, you find that production went up 50.5% uh, and employment went up only one half of 1%. What Walter Ruther is saying is that American companies in the last 11 years have bought and built $385 billion worth of new factories and new equipment, much of it automated equipment. In the auto industry alone, the big three have invested $7,200,000,000 in modern automated facilities. And the result has been unemployment. Like this unemployment. Like these unemployed General Motors workers. There they are, here we are. People wanting jobs, needing jobs. And there are the new factories, modern as all get out, but closed down tight. Since this is the way things have worked out, Mr. Ruther, do you oppose all this expansion? We don't object to that expansion in our productive capacity because we know the workers that I represent, they're grown people. They know that there are no economic Santa Clauses, that you can't get something for nothing, that you can only have higher living standards, and more of the good things of life, only as you create the economic wealth by the application of human labor human intelligence to the tools of economic abundance and the economic resources that we have access to. So they say, fine, we've got a bigger plant capacity, we've got more modern and more productive tools, but they say, if we aren't using these tools and we've got idle capacity and unemployment, then why? And the answer is, we aren't using our productive capacity because we haven't got the purchasing power in the hands of millions of families necessary to translate human needs into demand on the store counters of America. And that's why we're in trouble. We're in trouble, Walter Ruther says, 
In a sense, these machines can only do almost everything a human being can do, but not everything. Machines don't buy automobiles, for example, and that means unemployment. All right, since this is the situation, is the UAW opposed to automation? Many people, at least, have been told that unions oppose technological advances. Mr. Ruther, what about that? I have, I have been very sad when I hear a labor spokesman fight against improved technology. You know, King Canute couldn't stop the flow of the tide, and labor can't stop the flow of technology. Labor ought to welcome technology. You haven't gotten our pamphlets on automation. I shall see that you get them because we have, we have been standing on the housetops saying, give us the best automation you can bring in. Give us the most productive tools because we know that the only way we can have more is to make more. And the only way you can make more is to have more productive tools. We have been leading the parade for automation. We want automation. We want the peaceful use of the atom because only as we apply human labor, whether it be with hand or with brain, to the tools of production, can we create the economic wealth that we want to share? This is a General Motors contract that we signed in 1955 on page 66. Section 100 reads as follows. This is out of our agreement. My signature is at the end of this agreement. It reads as follows, and I quote, the annual improvement factor provided herein recognizes that a continuing improvement in the standards of living of employees depends upon technological progress, better tools, methods, processes, and equipment, and cooperative attitude on the part of all parties in such progress. It further, recognize, it further recognizes the principle that to produce more with the same amount of human effort is a sound economic and social objective. We want the best tools that General Motors can buy. We want the most productive automation machinery that the General Motors and Ford and Chrysler can create in cooperation with the machine tool industry. On this, there is no argument. We know we can have more only if the tools of production create more, and we want the most productive tools available. Let us suppose that we have no autom automation, no multiple drills, no huge presses to press out frames. What, in your judgment, would be the cost of an ordinary automobile today compared with the price that it actually obtains in the market? If we did not have the tools of mass production That's and economic right. abundance, That's there right. would be no automobile industry. Yes. There'd still be a few built around by hand and only a few fellows who were millionaire sport car owners would have them. There'd just be a handful and the roads would still be muddy and so forth. We all know that. But why do we make progress? We make progress because management wants to drive ahead. They want to make more money. They want to get more of the things that they want. But workers, when they drive for higher wages, why is it in a country where, there, where you have coolie wages, why is it that their rate of technology is always slower? Because when manpower is cheaper than machines, nobody gets a machine. But when you raise wages and it costs more to have manpower than machines, you invest in technology. And the drive for higher wages is perhaps the most powerful motivation that accelerates technological progress. On one thing, Walter Ruther and President Eisenhower are agreed. Automation by itself is not good or bad. It is like a knife or high explosive. It can be used to advance the well-being of people. Then it is good. Or it can be used to produce dark, hopeless tragedy, and then it is evil. But the question is, how do you tame automation? How do you make it serve people? The UAW says when men or women are laid off because of automation, when the plant moves, people should be given new jobs. If there are not new jobs, they should be given moving allowances to places where there are jobs. If they need training, they should get training. If they have to be re-educated for new jobs, then they should get the education and allowances to live on in the in-between times. But, says Senator Dirksen, who is sensitive to the interest of the big companies, doesn't this cost money? 
Now, among other things, you include, of course, a severance pay and also removal pay, where a facility is removed to another town and the employees have an opportunity to go so that uh, they would be paid for moving to another site. I think that's in your bargaining demand. That's right, right. but that, that's not a cost factor because when the company moves a factory, now let me give you a good example. You know, there's been a lot of uh, political propaganda circulating in Michigan about how the climate in Michigan, because of the Democratic administration in the, in the governor's office, is creating an unfavorable political climate and the automobile industry are all running away and other companies are running out of Michigan. But that isn't true. They're moving for reasons quite unrelated to politics. And the best example is that the last decision made by the Chrysler Corporation, and Chrysler Corporation is the last of the big three who have decentralized their operations. Uh, General Motors started out on a more decentralized basis. Ford was pretty compact in Detroit. They have decentralized since the war, and Chrysler now is getting around to that sort of thing. Chrysler Corporation recently announced that they were moving a plant from Evansville, Indiana, two plants there, to St. Louis, Missouri. Now, in Indiana, they consider that they got the most favorable political climate. They got a Republican administration, they got a right to work law, they got everything that, that the people who represent that point of view think constitutes a completely favorable climate from industry's point of view. And yet they're moving out of Indiana into a democratic city in a democratic state. Why? Because these moves have nothing to do with politics. They are moving there because the Evansville plant is antiquated. It's an old plant. It's inefficient. It's a high cost unit plant in terms of its physical layout and its equipment. And they're going to build a brand new plant in St. Louis. But the reason they aren't building a new plant in Evansville is St. Louis is closer to the market that, that plant will service. And that's why they're moving. Now, when the Chrysler Corporation moves, they will have to pay for the cost of moving their machinery and all the other things that go into the physical plant. And we think that moving the worker's family or providing the worker with some cushion until he can make a readjustment and get relocated himself is a part of the cost of doing business, just like moving the machinery. Now, the Chrysler Corporation will have a more modern, more efficient plant, and they will pay for the cost of moving the machinery out of the greater efficiency, out of the greater profitability of the new plant, and we think we ought to pay for the cost of moving the workers out of the same greater profitability and greater efficiency. So this isn't new money. This isn't going to cost the consumer anything. And I just think that, that if moving machinery is absorbed as a normal cost of doing business, that moving people also should be. That's all this is. But it won't cost the consumer a penny. All right. So, David, um, what do you think about this film? Oh, I mean, there's there's lots to say. Uh, um, two things quickly, and then I'm happy to say more. But one is for those folks who don't know, Walter Ruther is a very very important man in American labor history. In fact, he was called the most dangerous man in Detroit in the middle of the 20th century. Um, he didn't start the United Auto Workers, but he was he was a key figure and he became president, I wanna say right about near the end of World War II. And in 1946, he led the auto workers on a big strike against General Motors uh, that went on for quite a while. And, you know, General Motors at that point was Someone, some folks may know the old expression, what's good for General Motors is good for the United States. They were the, the big dog then, you know, think Amazon and Walmart today. Well, I was General Motors in 1946, which is a huge <laughs> indication of how our economy has shifted as well. Um, so Ruth is very well known and very well respected. Um, in the 1960s, he was a huge supporter of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. If you look at the Dr. King's March on Washington and his great speech and you look in the background, you'll see in many cases, Walter Ruther. A lot of the signs say for both jobs and freedom and they're printed by the UAW. So again, big supporter. Um, 
as you can see, he's a very articulate man. Um, he knows sort of economics. He knows how to run a business. He's not just this sort of cigar chomping, you know, corrupt union boss, you know, pounding the table. He can talk to senators and make some pretty sophisticated arguments. Um, the one downside to Ruther is he was pretty ruthless within his own union. I, years ago, I met a couple of old timers who had sort of locked horns with him back in the 50s and 60s. And they said, you know, it wasn't like the mine workers where they actually killed you if you if you locked horns. Um, but the one guy said he wound up with a basement, uh, I, an office in the sub basement of the union headquarters, which is called Solidarity House in Detroit. So Ruther was still a pretty tough infighter. Um, I'll just mention a couple things about, you know, this clearly is it's a kind of a simply structured film. You know, it's got sort of the, the, the scenes of automation and then you cut to his various testimony in 1959 in front of Congress. Any of you that are Congress junkies, um, Everett Dirksen, who, who was the Republican minority leader in the Senate during the Lyndon Johnson years um, is there. Johnson's the one with a really deep kind of gravelly wheezy voice. Um, and Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson both hated and kind of loved Everett Dirksen at the same time. They had a long time. They would talk to each other almost every day, apparently, and just bust each other's shoes, but really respected each other as well. Um, but, um, you know, I think Ruther makes a couple of, of really important points. Probably the most famous one is that story he tells about going to a plant and, you know, the plant manager sort of says, hey, you know, you can't get all these machines to pay union dues. <laughs> And he sort of goes back, ha, 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 you can't get machines to buy cars either, can you? Um, I've heard that same story told um, where, um, and maybe this is the same, uh, same event, you just didn't na name the guy, but I'm told that same story happened between Ruther and George Romney, um, who at one point was the president of American Motors Corporation. Again, if any old timers are listening today, you know, the, the Rambler, the AMC cars, that at one time was the fourth of the big three. And then it, that company died out in late 60s, early 70s. And if the name Romney sounds familiar, George Romney went from being president of AMC to governor of Michigan, and his son is Mitt Romney. So and supposedly, um, Walter Ruther made that same statement that George Romney said to him when he was showing him a plant, you know, Robots, you know, don't go on strike. And Ruther said, robots don't buy cars. So it's a classic argument. And I, I would argue um, it still holds water today. I mean, one of the things I always, I get, sometimes I have my students read stuff that was written back in the 1930s by New Deal labor economists who started to say, um, the, one of the first things we have to do to get out of a depression is we got to pay workers a little more money and let them organize unions safely so they can bargain for better wages. Because when workers ha have more money in their pocket, they'll go out and spend it. Um, you know, the, it's the old, um, if I remember my Econ 101, the marginal propensity to spend and consume. If you give a worker a dollar, that man or woman is gonna probably go out and spend it because they need to. They gotta buy food, they gotta buy shoes, whatever. If you give a millionaire another dollar, that man or woman probably ain't gonna run out and spend it. They're gonna save it, they're gonna find some wackadoodle investment to try to make a hundred out of one, you know, that sort of thing. And it goes on, it went on years later. So, um, you know, remember th this testimony from Ruth there is more than 60 years ago. Um, but I think some of his, you know, it's not all the same, but some of his basic points are really true about workers as consumers. The other is, again, I think Ruth is making a very sophisticated argument here that many people don't really make or don't know about, but I, I would argue it's still true. And that is many unions, there are, it is absolutely true some unions fought automation tooth and nail. A good example is the printers, the newspaper printers. When the, um, in the 1970s and 80s, when newspapers went from what's called hot type to cold type, the printers unions fought that tooth and nail and then wound up in some cases going on strike. They got special contracts where the old timers stayed on till retirement. Um, but the auto workers, particularly under Ruther and, and um, to a large extent, for example, the mine workers under John L. Lewis at the same time, mostly worked with the companies on automation. 
Now, some of their members weren't happy. Some of their members were very distrustful. But Ruther had this argument that, that if, if um, auto companies automated more and more, that in fact, and remember what he says in his testimony, if they're willing to help retrain workers, then in fact, new opportunities might open up. Or as a company becomes more productive and more efficient, it makes more profit and workers through profit sharing might actually make more money. So he was aware of job loss. He was concerned about it. But he also thought that equation was not the only one, that there were other aspects to automation and that a, a labor union, if it took a kind of um, multi-step process, you might say, to automation, there might be certain advantages in it. Fascinating. The, um, I guess, David, what's interesting is to think about this and think about it in terms of, and what they were talking about was the idea of like, well, relocating workers. If you're going to relocate your factory, you should also factor in the, you should budget for relocating your workers as well. Um, and I, you know, I think about now, and I think about the idea that um, during the pandemic, having people working remotely, and now some of these tech jobs, they're just spreading themselves all over the world. Um, how do you think that plays out? Or was there a historical precedence for that yeah. at all? Um, I, I do know that, that um, you know, in, <laughs> excuse me, um, with the auto workers, their contracts have kind of ebbed and flowed a bit on this question. Um, usually auto workers contracts are three or five years. And what they try to do, at least the auto un workers unions try to do what's called pattern bargaining. Like if they make up, what they'll usually do is pick one of the main, you know, they call them the big three. They're not as big as they used to be. And the union isn't as big as it used to be either. But say they'll pick Chrysler. And if they can negotiate a contract with Chrysler, they'll then go to GM and Ford and say, you know, see what we did here. We want you to follow the pattern. Um, there have been a couple of cases, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact years, but I know in some of the UAW contracts, they've worked really hard to put in this, particularly in a period when they thought there was going to be a big wave of plant closings or moving or readjusting or retooling or whatever. They tried to include a number of different things, sometimes what's called sub supplemental unemployment benefits, sometimes retraining grants, sometimes moving grants. And, and I know um, some people may remember a couple of years ago, the big plant in Lordstown, Ohio shut down. That's one that had sort of been big for a while, it shrunk for a while, it regrew for a while. Mr. Trump claimed he'd keep it open, <laughs> it didn't happen, so it shut down. And I know some workers, depending on their seniority, some of the more senior workers, people with 10, 20, 30 years in the company, did get the opportunity to transfer to another plant. Now, the challenge there, you know, sometimes it's the cost, as Mr. Ruther pointed out 60 plus years ago. For many of these people, they said, well, you know, I've lived in this town 50 years and my aged parents are here and, you know, my ex-wife is here with the kids, so I'm not moving thousand miles to another plant even though i could get a job there so the moving has there's all kinds of of questions involved and i think particularly um in many smaller industrial communities you are you're often dealing with with th with two factors one is simply long time family and personal links and i think that needs to be recognized you know, in theory, yeah, sure. You, I mean, some people do it all the time. People pack up their car. I mean, I moved from here from Wisconsin. But in fact, Wisconsin wasn't my hometown. My hometown was in Boston. So when I moved from Wisconsin, we left behind some friends we really liked. But OK, we move. Um, the other is is the cost of moving housing in a lot of small industrial cities. If the, fa the, the one key factory goes belly up, your house is now worth nothing. You're underwater. So the idea of, oh, just sell your house and buy another one, you know, for example, people who move to Raleigh, if you move from to Raleigh from California, you can afford a mansion in Raleigh, even if you sold a small house in California. But if you move from, you know, Dubuque, Iowa to, to Raleigh, um, Raleigh might as well be San Francisco. The housing market seems very expensive to you and your house, if you can even sell it, is selling for a song. Um, you know, occasionally you read these articles, everyone should move to 
I mean, I'm just picking on Dubuque. I don't know if it's true for sure, but you know, you can buy a Victorian mansion for eighty thousand dollars. Well, yeah, but where are you going to get a job to even pay that mortgage? You know, so um, these kind of moving costs. There's all kinds of both economic costs, but also sort of social and personal costs as well. All right. So um, this next film. So that film, first film, I would say. That was pro labor. I mean, UAW pro labor. Um, this next film was made by AC Delco, and AC Delco is GM. Is that I'm, is that correct? Yeah, yeah General Motors. And um, this film is fascinating. When I first saw it, it was a, another collector had a copy of this, and I saw it, and my jaw dropped because it is an amazing film that's trying to motivate workers. To be better but is basically saying it's your fault that these plants are closing because of what you're doing and what you're not doing and it is this amazing example of blaming your workers for maybe some missteps at a higher level um but it is really it's phenomenal it's called uh, what's it all about Let's watch that. What's it all about? Every day we hear the words. Words like quality, productivity, excellence, competition. Words don't seem to get the whole message across. But we can tell you what it's all about. It's about work and jobs and what's happening at Delco Products. Some of you know right now what's happening. There have been layoffs, closed doors, empty rooms, silent machines. They're moving out the equipment that was once used to build appliance motors. And this equipment is only two years old. It's expensive machinery designed to help us do better work, make better motors. But it didn't work out that way. These machines were bought so Delco products could be more competitive. Now, they're moving them out selling them to the competition. Why? Because the machines didn't work? Uh-uh. Not really. We just couldn't compete in the marketplace. Somehow, we didn't put it all together. Sometimes, some of us didn't think it was necessary to come to work every day. The cost of quality in Dayton couldn't meet the competition elsewhere. Now, the doors are closed. 1,300 people were laid off. Some did come back to work in other areas, but a lot of jobs were lost. Many can relate the shutdown to work in the hermetically sealed appliance motor area. For them, that's where it happened. What's it all about? It's about competition. In the whole world, people are working making the motors that once was our job. 
Somebody down south. Somebody out west. Even somebody in Japan is doing that work. The need is still there. But the competition is getting the job done. Now you know. You say there's really nothing to worry about? We have new products coming up? Yes and no. We can't take two steps backward while we take one step forward. We need the new products and the old business too. That's the only way we can stay healthy. We can learn a lot from what happened in other industries. Most of us know that nine out of 10 home radios are made in Japan. That industry is con in the USA. Did you know that two out of every five pair of shoes are made overseas? Little league or big league, nine out of 10 baseball mitts sold in the US are made somewhere else. That sweater you wear to the bowling alley, where was it made? Seven out of 10 sweaters come from another land. And motorcycles? American motorcycles have just about disappeared. 19 out of 20 are foreign made. You get the picture? We're losing to the competition. It's time we recognize that working means a full day, every working day. We mean everybody. The others are gaining because we have forgotten how we made our business strong. We are only strong when everybody comes to work on time, all the time. We are strong when each person does his job and does it right the first time. How many times have you heard someone say, don't work too hard? Hard work is what made us strong. We are only strong when we are willing to compete with the whole world. There's no real way the government can save us. Tariffs and surtaxes only help for a little while. In the world market, foreign governments would soon put taxes on all goods made here. That means people in many US industries lose the competitive edge. If they don't have jobs, they don't buy cars or appliances that need motors. Then it comes right back to us. We should know the facts of life. And here they are. As for appliance and air moving motors, we're out of business, closed up, shut down. We didn't cut the mustard. In Hermetic Motors, we are operating at 50% of our capacity. That's one half of what we can do. Industrial Motors, we're working at 75% of capacity. A little better, but we should be running at 100%. We're 25% down. On the good side, we do have the energy absorbers to build. We are ahead of competitors in this one area. But how long can we stay that way? You can bet on this. We can't research and develop new ideas and then lose the business we had. Most of us grew up knowing about competition. If you score a field goal and the other guy scores a touchdown, he's ahead. That's what it's all about. Now, let's talk about what we can do about it. The equipment we work with 
is designed to be productive at a normal, consistent pace. It's the best machinery we could design and buy. But it must be run from the very moment you start your shift. If you're doing your job, you know it. But if you're not, you know that too. You see, we're paying the highest rates. We should set the highest goals for ourselves. The machines are there all the time, but they can't be used to advantage when people stay home from work. When we come to the plant, we come here with the idea that we'll do a full job for our pay, a full measure. That's what it's all about. We are the people who can really make the difference in competition. That's us. Mm -hmm. Us. Everybody has his own job. What matters is how we do it. We can't blame the other guy. It's our pride and our sense of value. If we don't do the job, somebody else will. And he or she may not live in Dayton or Rochester. The competition is out there wherever people are willing to work at the job and give a 100% effort. No amount of good management, modern machinery, or product research can substitute for our pride in our work. This runs pretty deep in all of us. We can only walk the world with dignity when we know we're giving our very best. And you know when you are. Dignity isn't the color of your shirt or the cut of your jacket. Dignity is what's in your heart and hands. Pride is knowing that you help to build a product that can and will compete with anything and anybody in the whole world. And it's something more than that, too. It's knowing we have a place to work. And there's a job there for us. A place to work is where we find dignity. Believe me. It's how we go about it that counts. What's happened has happened. We can't replay the game and get back the jobs we lost. But we can make sure that it doesn't happen again and again. Well, we can. That's more like it. We is a big word. It's a personal word. It means a big effort from all of us. With a little pride and honest concern, we could put Delco products right back where we belong, on top. When we do it, we're buying something for ourselves. You see, this is our place. We work here. That, that is what it's all about. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's amazing to me uh, because this was meant to be shown to uh, employees. And this is like, you know, I'm sure that there were examples of, of people taking advantage of things, but to do it on that level is is amazing to see. And it's, it's interesting to see how quickly they scapegoat uh, the workers. 
Yeah, no, I think I think you nailed it, Skip. It's really sort of, um, you know, if they're thinking they're doing worker motivation to blame workers is not exactly the way to go about it. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very familiar story. I, I can't remember the date on that. I think that's late 1960s. Yeah, I didn't, I couldn't find an actual year for it, but it was either early 70s or late 60s. Yeah, and so that's kind of the first big wave of of plant closures. And as they reference, you know, the South, I believe the plant is in Dayton, Ohio. So a lot of plants have moved to the South in the 50s and 60s, or as I mentioned, out West. And of course, you're getting greater Japanese competition, particularly in the auto industry and the auto parts. Some people may know AC Delco to this day makes, makes spark plugs and brake parts. And so it's still part of I think it's still part of the General Motors family. Although I do know a few years ago, one of the things General Motors did was um, it it cut loose a lot of its part supplier in terms of like union contracts. Like at one point, a lot of even the suppliers were covered by various contracts. Now the auto parts industry is almost completely ununionized. I mean, the only part of the auto industry that remains unionized are the assembly plants. And of course, the the so-called big three, all the automakers would love to get out of those contracts. Because in fact, most of the assembly plants for foreign manufacturers in this country tend to be built further in the South and they're not unionized. In fact, just recently, I read a book manuscript for a publisher that's coming out that shows, I mean, Toyota, Volkswagen, um, I'm trying to think, you, you name it, Subaru, BMW. you know, Honda, uh, Mercedes-Benz, they're all down in Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, and um, in almost every one of them, the manufacturers sort of sweet talk to UAW. Oh, sure, we'll, we'll have a union someday. Don't worry about it. We'll work on it once we get the plant up. Yeah, right. The minute the plant's up and the UAW starts to organize, they fight them tooth and nail. And some people may know there, um, there's a big Volkswagen plant in Chattanooga that had several organizing campaigns and the union lost. Um, so it's a real challenge. But in this particular movie, I think you're right. There's just a lot of like, you know, um, the message is you're not disciplined. You got lousy quality, you know. Um, and it occurred to me, um, you know, the question we don't have an answer for is sort of when were th was this film shown? I mean, I'm guessing they must have had like all like all worker meetings. In fact, in labor law, it's called a captive audience meeting. Under Again, some people may not know this, but and this happens more often during union organizing campaigns. But in fact, a company can do it at any time. If you work in a company, your boss can say that some morning, you know, two in the afternoon, you all have to be in the break room um, and you have to get paid. You can't they can't make you take time off. But as long as the boss says, you know, we're turning off the line for an hour, you know, you'll get paid to show up in the break room. The boss can do pretty much what he or she wants, you know, they can't like beat you, but you know, so during a union campaign, in some campaign, the, the Amazon uh, warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, did this for like a month before the vote, almost every day, they had these captive audience meetings. So and they can tell you well, whatever they want about unions, they're not supposed to threaten to close the plant. Although a lot of companies sort of dance around that. You know, well, it's, you know, we may not be competitive in the future. And gee, what would happen then? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my guess is that this this film was shown like all around AC Delco, you know, at various uh, worker fun. Maybe they made it, you know, a fun event. They said, oh, you know, free ice cream, but you have to come watch the movie. I don't know what they did, but it's it's it is interesting. Yeah, it's um, a pretty good guess uh, regarding um you know, all right, we're going to have a meeting, a company meeting, everybody show up. Um, and, and so uh, there, I asked people for questions in the comments. Sure. And uh, somebody asked, is there a company that saw that it was failing and was able to pivot successfully to another industry? And let, let's make that, um, you know, Let's not make that early 20th century because I'm sure a lot of carriage manufacturers became auto manufacturers. Right, but um, right. <laughs> let's say like from the 50s on. Hmm. Um, 
one example, and it's 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 sort of small little rays of hope, you might call it. Here, right here in North Carolina, the textile industry, you know, most of the big mills are gone. You know, Canapolis is gone, Roanoke Rapids, um, but scattered around the state are some smaller plants that are not doing what they used to do, which is like spinning thread or making t-shirts, but they've gone into various specialty, various what's called non-wovens. I mean, my colleagues over at the textile college could tell you a heck of a lot more than I can about the specifics of it. But, you know, I've had a chance to meet a few folks um, in the industry and they, they always, they make a great effort to say it's not dead and gone. Um, we have one of the last textile colleges in the country, but it's very, it's very active. It's got a lot of money. It's got a lot of research investment. So that's one example. But again, you have to almost think of textiles, not as your grandpappy's textiles. So um, the other, and this may not answer the question. So if I'm not quite doing it, but we were actually talking a little bit right before the start of our, our program. Um, I think there are certain industrial cities that have survived and gone in new directions. And, I, and in fact, there are several historians and a number of urban geographers and sociologists that have written a lot about trying to figure out sort of why is, like the example I gave in our discussion was, why is Pittsburgh doing relatively well? And I put relative in quotes, you know, there's, there's certainly poor neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, there are people that are unemployed but nothing like Youngstown, Ohio. And I've been to, you know, where do labor historians have conferences? We don't go to Palm Springs. We go to Youngstown, Ohio for a conference. Um, and it was really cool to see the city and the people were, were wonderful there. I went on this very cool tour of sort of abandoned steel mills. Um, and I think obviously Youngstown's a much smaller city. There's all kinds of reasons why. But I'm always bring up places like Pittsburgh and Milwaukee is another example um, that, Milwaukee is a, it lives in Chicago's shadow, but it's a relatively healthy city. A lot of insurance in Milwaukee, um, a lot of precision machine tooling that never went out of business. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not sure always industries completely change, but certain industries find niches and pockets. The U.S. steel industry, we often hear about, because like Youngstown, the big giant steel mills are mostly gone, but a lot of what's called specialty steel, custom steel making um, is often still made in this country. It's again, made in small badges. It's very specialized products. It's not just the giant steel bars. Um, so, and I will add, there are many economic historians that would argue that we, this country could have remained viable in steel making for decades. We just chose not to invest in it. What we did was we, after World War II, we helped the German and the Japanese economy recover through things like the Marshall Plan. We gave them money to modernize their steel mills, but we never did it in this country. And either the government should have done it or the industries themselves should have invested, but they didn't, so. All right, Dr. Zondeman, we have a, another question. Somebody asked a bunch of questions, <laughs> but we'll get to um, two of them. Around the time of the Delco film, would, Per, uh, factory production lines been so diverse in terms of race and gender, or was that just for the movie? And then also, um, she wanted to know, do professors have unions? Um, okay, they're both great questions. I mean, the fir I'll take the second one first, just real quickly. Um, faculty unions kind of vary around the country. Um, mostly, if you live in a state um, that allows public workers to organize and bargain, um, and you work at a public university, chances are you may belong to a faculty union. Not always, because faculty are notoriously hard to organize. They all think they're special and important, don't need a union. I try to convince people, you're a worker, you're an employee. Your boss can still screw you in some ways, even if you have tenure. Anyways, um, if you happen to work at a private university, you fall under what's called the yeshiva decision of the Supreme Court, and that's Yeshiva University. It's a Jewish university in New York City where the faculty tried to organize back in the 60s or 70s, and the Supreme Court ruled that faculty were management and did not fall under U.S. labor law protections. Um, here in North Carolina, I'm, I'm a state employee. I work in North Carolina State, and in this state, we do not allow public workers to collectively bargain 
a contract. I think that's a terrible law, but it is the law and courts have upheld it, which I think is bizarre. I can join a union. I belong to the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, but our chapter at NC State is a non-bargaining chapter. So the law is very mixed. It depends on where you work and what's, what state you're in. Um, as far as the first question, it's an excellent observation about sort of the diversity of the men and women, people of color, white people. Um, my guess, well, I know one thing, I'm going to guess a second thing. My, my guess is probably some of it was quite deliberately done by the company and the film production company to make the company look, oh, we welcome everybody and you know, we're a good employer. We welcome everyone to work for us as long as you're a hard worker or blah, blah, blah. Um, but also if this was made late sixties, early seventies, it's after the civil rights act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination in employment. And it took a while, you know, it didn't happen overnight. And in fact, there've been several good books written on particularly the fight of black workers to get jobs in the South where there was an enormous amount of resistance. But by the early set, early to mid seventies, more and more workplaces were racially integrated. But I'll make one final point, and that is ironically, when many of the, just when black folks started to get a foot in the door and get jobs in manufacturing with unions where they paid good wages, many of these companies started to go out of business or at least shrink and had to lay off people. And in many places with a union contract, it was done by seniority. And since many of the black men and women had been hired the last, last in, first out, that was kind of the principle. There was some litigation about that. And in a couple of cases, court said, you can't completely follow seniority. If it's gonna mean firing all the black workers, you have to work out some, um, you know, some other mechanism, but it was, it, it's, it's a fact that many black industrial workers lost jobs fairly quickly. It was another sad fact. I'll just make one other quick point, not since it, it reminds me of seniority and all. Another interesting thing happened, and I had a, doc, a master's student years ago write a fascinating thesis on when in Durham, in the big tobacco factories, they had a number of black workers as well as white. And that was true going back to the 40s, but they had segregated unions. So in 1965, when you have the Civil Rights Act, um, the government tells the, the, the two unions at the, at the big like Liggett and Myers plant or Chesterfield, wherever it was, you have to merge your unions. You can't have segregated locals anymore. So the white union goes to the black union and says, okay, we have to merge our seniority lists. So all the white people will go to the top of the list and all the black people will go to the bottom of the list. And the black union says, the hell with that. We're not going to tell a 30-year veteran you're behind a, a white guy who got hired last month. That's not going to happen. And they ended up going to court and fighting about it. And the court said, no, you have to merge your seniority list so that the guy with 30 years, doesn't matter what color he is, is on the top. And the guy or gal with one month is at the bottom. So, I mean, I think it strikes many of us today as sort of absurd. But my student, she, she had these great records she was working with that, you know, the white union in the late 60s just assumed, oh, of course, that's the way we're going to do it. You know, what are you black people complaining about? You know, so um, creating an integrated workforce had its own deep challenges. I should say, David, um, having grown up in Dayton, Ohio in the 70s, ah. um, I have many friends who both their parents worked at the plants. Um, so um, I know that they hire both men and women. And they were working, you know, there was all three shifts running. So I would have friends that would work, whose parents would work third shift because we would have to be quiet <laughs> during the day. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And Dayton was sort of, you know, the center of a lot of this um, sort of smaller auto, you know, auto parts and small motors manufacturing, an enormous number of companies in, in a Dayton, you know, Akron had the huge rubber factories. Dayton, Akron, Youngstown, that whole Steubenville, that whole sort of industrial belt in Northern Ohio. And I don't know if you still have family there, but you know, Dayton, Toledo, all those places have struggled for decades. Um, so, I mean, my wife had a friend from, she worked for IBM in the eighties and had a friend in training who came from Toledo. So when, when we moved to Wisconsin in 1987, we went, we stayed in Toledo for a few days and it was fun. 
Uh, but boy, you could see half that city was just closed. Um, so yeah, that's an area of the country that took, particularly in the late 70s, 80s, massive economic transformation. And many of those cities have just never recovered. Right. Um, and that's why Ohio, you know, Ohio politics, um, you know, if you go back 100 years, Ohio was sort of Republican. And then the middle of the 20th century, because of strong unions, Ohio was a Democratic stronghold. And today, Ohio is once again a, a red state. And it's it's shaped by a lot of factors, but demographics, economics are huge factors in that. Right. Well, David, thank you so much for uh, joining us again. Um, it, stuff about labor, the history of labor just keeps coming back again and again and again. So it's really fascinating to kind of take something, some of my films, and you put context and then us realize, oh, yeah, we're still dealing with that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, they, both of these films, there are some, some of it looks quote unquote dated and some of it is like, my goodness, that yeah. could have been made yesterday, not 50 or 60 years ago. Yep. So Definitely. anytime, you know that I love doing this. This is just excellent, fun excellent. and educating. And I, I should say to everybody tuning in, uh, thank you for tuning in with us. Uh, we will be doing something next month. But we just don't know what it is yet. We haven't figured it out. We have to narrow it down. So, you know, I have 36,000 films. So trying to find ones that are interesting and having experts talk about them, um, you know, we have to figure that out. So please keep um, checking in with AV Geeks and checking in with uh, the Hunt Library. And um, we will see you. Everybody have a good weekend. Everybody have a good, safe Labor Day weekend next weekend. And we will see everybody soon. Everybody take care.